Let's get started. All right, so for the project, uh, I finished looking at your estimations of the demand, and I've put comments into MU Online. Uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. For the most part, uh, things looked really good. Um, I'll mention that for your final submission, you're going to have to prepare a report that kind of explains an overview of the entire process, the design process. And that report should include a written description of your assumptions behind um, demand estimation. So even if you have hand calculations that shows what the factors are, then that, that should also be written up in paragraph form for the final submission. And it's not just demand estimation, but actually the, uh, the final report uh, should be an overview of the entire project, including all phases. You know, the general idea of what you went through when you did the uh, pipe sizing, what is the uh, design rationale for the reservoir sizing, for the uh, cost evaluation, and so on. So I did want to mention that. Don't be um, deceived by the, pat the fact that you got a relatively high score on the draft stage. That doesn't mean that you can just turn the same thing in again for the final report. That means if I, if I gave you 99 or 100 points for the draft, that means I think that you're where you need to be at for this point. But I expect the finished product to be even more polished. So are there any questions about that? All right, so then on Tuesday, um, phase two should be submitted to MU Online before 3.30 p.m. And what you need to submit in that case is just two maps. And the two maps should be annotated according to the description in the handout. I also showed an example of a, of a good annotated map in class last time. So if you want to look back on that video to get an idea of the size of the text relative to the overall print, then uh, feel free to review that video. All right, so today we're going to continue talking about specific energy. Yes? No, for phase two, you only need to submit the two maps. Um, but in your final submission, your written report should explain, you know, what is optimization in the context of, of this project, you know, what you were trying to balance in terms of maximizing the pressure and minimizing the pipe size. All right, so we're going to continue talking about open channel flow. And specifically, now that we've talked about um, energy relative to the channel bottom, what we can do now is start to evaluate what happens when the flow gets disturbed. Manning's equation will tell us the depth of flow for conditions that are steady and uniform. And it does a nice job of that. But conditions aren't always steady and uniform. Sometimes there would be a uh, step up or a drop off in the channel. There can be obstructions like fallen tree limbs or debris in the bottom of a channel. And channels can get narrower and wider. And so we have to have some sort of a uh, set of tools that will help us to predict how the flow depth changes in response to all of those irregularities. And that's what we're going to start on today. And the main tool that we're going to use for predicting the, the flow's response to disturbances is the specific energy diagram. One other announcement, hydraulic jump day. All right, so hydraulic jump day is going to be on uh, March 30th. That is uh, the day after our exam, well, two days after our exam. So we've got spring break. You come back from spring break, and I ruin you with the exam on Tuesday. And then we kind of recover from that on Thursday with hydraulic jump day. And we'll go into the uh, fluids lab and look at the flume. And uh, if you want to do hydraulic jump day proper, what you need to do is you need to order a blue wig. Uh, so here's an eBay listing for a blue wig that would do well. So you just go ahead and indicate blue and order that, $5, and then you've got a blue wig for the rest of your life. All right. Yes, question. On which day? Hydraulic jump day? You're really missing out. Was that the Virginia's conference? We're going to have it anyway. That's the day. Although, if, if there's cake left over, we'll put it in the fridge. But I don't know how to do that, but I don't mind if somebody else does. You guys can wear blue wigs still at the Virginia's conference. 
Do you get bonus points? Uh, what kind of a question is that? Question. How about free admission to hydraulic jump day? No. I've already got like nine of those blue wigs, so I certainly don't need to buy any more. But you'll be wearing one. Why blue? Water. <laughs> yeah, water. I'll tell you more about the uh, proper observance of hydraulic jump day, but this is what I needed to tell you now so that you have time to order it, because I think this wig is coming from China. <laughs> so you want to give yourself plenty of time. Let's see. Oh, no, this is in Pennsylvania. All right. So it'll get here in time. If you order now, March 24th is the estimated delivery date, and we're having it on March 30th. Okay? You don't have to wear a wig, but it'd be awesome if you did. There's other ways to participate, like writing poems, uh, preparing a poster, uh, doing calculations. So... There are, there's a lot of jump songs, jump themed songs. There's plenty of those already. All right, enough fun. Now the fun continues with the specific energy diagram. All right, so let's look at the specific energy diagram. Remember that what it shows us is that there are alternate depths, for example. If we have a certain amount of specific energy, that vertical line could go up and you can solve for two different depths that have the same amount of energy. And this point of minimum specific energy corresponds to the depth that's the critical depth. Um, so any depth greater than the critical depth is corresponded to subcritical flow, and any depth that's uh, less than the critical depth is supercritical flow. So that's just a quick reminder of what we were talking about in class last time. Um, now, think about this curve was created for a flow rate of 10 cubic meters per second. So for a fixed flow rate, a fixed roughness, and a fixed channel width. And so what we would have to do to get different specific energies and different depths, and we'd, we would adjust the slope in order to cause those different, um, those different depths. Now, here's a graph that's a little bit different. Although these were lots of different specific energies for a fixed flow rate, this next figure is for one specific energy and different flow rates. All right, so consider the uh, labels on the axis here. On the horizontal axis is flow rate Q. On the vertical axis is energy. And uh, remember, we can measure energy with units of length. Sometimes we call it head. Um, but when we have the maximum flow rate that can be achieved with a certain amount of, uh, of energy, that's the critical depth, the depth when that maximum flow rate's occurring. Um, critical conditions correspond to the most hydraulically efficient conditions. You, you're maximizing your flow rate at the critical depth. Um, now, another thing I wanted to point out here is that E naught is the total energy. And so the energy, the specific energy, is in two places. Uh, it's in the depth and it's also in the velocity head. And so whatever energy isn't in the depth is in the velocity head. And so down here in this range, below the uh, critical depth, are conditions here supercritical or subcritical? Supercritical. Anytime the flow depth is less than the critical depth, you've got supercritical conditions. And so down here below the critical depth, the majority of the energy is in the velocity head. But then when your flow depth is more than the critical depth, you have a proportionally smaller amount of energy in the velocity head and more of the energy exists as depth. So here's what we need to kind of think of in terms of critical flow. Critical flow is either the minimum specific energy that will convey a certain flow rate, or you can think of it the other way around. It's really two sides of the same coin. That is, the, the other way of thinking about it is it's the maximum discharge for a certain amount of specific energy. So if you only have a fixed amount of energy, let's say water flowing down a river, um, it's not going to, on its own, gain or lose energy. And so 
the, uh, the way that you would maximize discharge for that amount of energy is to have the critical depth, and that's the critical flow. Now, this energy term, remember, has units of length. And later on in today's lecture, we're going to talk about an easy way to calculate the specific energy when you have critical conditions. It's just kind of a, a, coincidental, a coincidental thing that you don't actually have to solve for the velocity head when you've got uh, critical conditions. And again, this little arrow here is to reinforce the idea that uh, a critical flow you can either think of it as minimum specific energy for a certain discharge or the maximum discharge that can be conveyed at a certain amount of specific energy. And maximum discharge will be important when we, at the end of today's lecture, talk about chokes. When we talk about when you put enough debris in a channel that it actually starts to back the water up upstream. And why water backs up when you put an obstruction. And when you have a river and you've got a pile of trash in the river, why doesn't the water just go over that pile of trash? Why does it sometimes have to start backing up before it can make it over that? And in some cases, it doesn't have to back up. If it's just a small pile of trash in the river, then the water will be able to flow over it without causing any upstream disturbance. We'll try and differentiate between when it chokes, which is when we're talking about pooling upstream, and when it doesn't choke. And it ties into this idea of maximum discharge for a certain amount of specific energy. I hope that'll become more clear as we go through it today. All right, so here's what we want to think about is, first of all, a drop in the channel bed. Specific energy is where you're measuring how much energy there is relative to the bottom of the channel. But here, the bottom of the channel goes down by this delta Z. So what it means is that location one, upstream, there's a certain amount of energy. But now here at location two, it gained some additional energy because of the delta Z. The water went over this hump, and now it has more energy than it did at one. Um, now, trying to figure out what is the depth going to be in response to that step, we have to do kind of an analysis procedure. And we're going to be looking at a, a specific energy diagram and trying to find out the new depth. Is it getting deeper or is it getting shallower? And uh, from this picture, it looks like the water is getting deeper. And that'll be true some of the time. But actually, there are conditions where the flow will get more shallow because of a drop down, such as this delta Z. And the way that we know whether the flow is going to get deeper or more shallow is the first thing we have to do is look at whether conditions are subcritical or supercritical at location one. And we can do that either by comparing the, the known depth to the critical depth, if we've previously calculated that. Or the other way to diagnose flow regime is just by calculating the Froude number at a certain location. So if you calculate the Froude number at one and find it subcritical, then having that information available will help you to predict what it does after the drop. If it's supercritical, it's going to do something different after the drop. Now, which way it's going to go, we have to look at a specific energy diagram to understand this. And let me dim the lights because I want you to get the full magnificence of this animation that's about to hit you. Because I spent a couple of semesters ago, I spent, oh, I don't know, like a solid hour doing this animation. So you tell me if it was time well spent. We have a, a specific energy diagram, and we start off with our initial depth, Y1. Okay, so that's the depth of flow before the step. All right. So to try and figure out what's going to happen, um, right now we can see that Y1 is greater than the critical depth, and so is... Is it supercritical or subcritical? Subcritical. Anytime your flow depth is larger than the critical depth, you've got subcritical conditions. And so let me write that on the board just to emphasize it so we can keep it in our mind. Is um, at one, conditions are subcritical because knowing that helps us to know 
uh, where to go on that graph. Okay, so here's our specific energy diagram. Big animation number one. See that brown line just went over there? Let me see. Not bad, right? All right. So the first thing you need to do is find your depth on the specific energy diagram and start on the, on the vertical axis and you draw an arrow over until it intercepts the uh, specific energy diagram. And so this is the subcritical depth for a certain amount of energy. There also is a supercritical depth that has the same amount of energy. If we go down this crossing of the curve is the same amount of energy, but that's what, what we'd expect if conditions were supercritical, but they're not. Okay, so our next thing is we go down and inter yet yeah, there's another animation. All right, we go down and we find out how much energy is there initially, so our E1. This isn't always a graphical procedure. We could do this uh, numerically using the equations, too. And so how would you find E1? Well, you would just say, I know that E is Y, the flow depth, plus the velocity head, which is V squared divided by 2G. Or, if I didn't want to do it in terms of V squared divided by 2G, you can also do Q squared divided by 2G A squared. And sometimes that's actually the easier thing to do. It will be today in one of our examples. Okay, so you find out how much energy there was at 1. And now because of the drop, the energy at 2 is going to be higher. So in other words, we could write the equation that the energy at 2 is the energy at 1 plus delta Z. Why is the energy at 2 higher? It's because now we've got this delta Z as well. So that drop just added some additional energy to the water because the channel bottom is lower than it used to be and so that the energy that used to be potential energy is now in the specific energy because remember specific energy is measured with respect to the channel bottom and so when the channel bottom goes down the specific energy goes up so on this figure what that means is you shift sideways in the amount of delta Z and there it is um, you find the new specific energy either with the formula or graphically just by going over the amount of delta Z. And then you're going to go up. Oops, wrong direction. Then you go up, and you've got two crossings. You've got the uh, supercritical depth and the subcritical depth. And which of those new depths to choose depends on if conditions were either supercritical or subcritical at one. And in our case, we found that they were subcritical. So that means we go all the way up to the second crossing and then to the left to find the new depth Y2. And so that's the graphical procedure. You go over to the specific energy diagram, down, increase the delta Z, back up again, and you find your Y2. So it's just reflecting off of the specific energy curve. Now how would we do that quantitatively rather than graphically? Well, you would take the E2 that you just found and you'd solve for the new depth y2. And so remember this formula, E is y plus the velocity head. We would say E2 is y2 plus the velocity head at 2. And you had some practice in the homework you submitted today at solving for unknown y's. In a trapezoidal channel, it gets fun, right? I had some people saying that they're Cassius couldn't find the, uh, yeah. If you know how to solve the equation right, can you do it with no trouble or, okay. All right. Yes. Good point. Yeah, we don't know what the depth is, so how do we know what the velocity is, right? That's your question? Yeah, so he's, he's pointing out the fact that if we left the velocity head as V, then we've got two unknowns because we're trying to solve for y, but now if y isn't known, then we don't know v because v is q divided by a, and uh, so that is v is q b y. And that's actually kind of leading you in the direction of the solution, why we say q squared instead. Because if we say 
squared divided by 2g a squared, then instead of a squared, I'll say for a rectangular channel, by squared. And so then now our only unknown, since we calculated some numerical value for e, our only unknown will be y. Exactly. Yeah, we do assume that uh, continuity applies and Q1 is equal to Q2. Great question. Are there other questions? Yes? Ah, okay. Yeah, so if it was critical to begin with, then we would have operated down in this other part of the curve. And so we'll have an example where we'll do that. But basically what it means is that um, you'd go for the critical depth you know, in the secondary crossing, you'd start at this would be your new depth instead of this. And so when it was subcritical, the depth got bigger, right? If you had supercritical con conditions, then a step down means that the uh, flow depth's going to decrease because, you know, it's lower on that curve when you've got an increase. So we will see that, that same example in just a moment. Okay, so I'd like you to apply those ideas, that step-by-step -step process. We're going to do it numerically here rather than graphically. What you need to do is, first of all, diagnose the flow regime at one. Find out, is it supercritical or subcritical? You can use the uh, Froud number to do that. After you've determined, then you'd find the uh, energy at two with this formula. It's going to be the specific energy at one plus the delta Z that happens. So then you'd find that the total, I need to stop saying total, you'll find the specific energy at 2 and then use this specific energy formula to find y and the hint here is that the area is the channel width b times the flow depth y. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the channel width is the 8, exactly. Let's see if you're headed in the right direction here. Did everybody find that it was subcritical conditions? Because the Froud number is less than one. So the reason why we need to know that is later on when we finish, we're going to solve a cubic equation and we'll have three roots. One of those three roots is going to be negative, which we can just throw away. But then of the other two roots, it's indicating that there are two depths that have the same amount of specific energy. And the lower one will be the uh, supercritical depth that has a certain amount of specific energy and then the larger depth would be the subcritical depth and so if we were subcritical before at one it'll be subcritical again at two and so knowing this Froud number is how we choose from among our two non-negative roots at the end Okay, so here is uh, where it goes after that. Um, we find the energy at 1. And so the specific energy at 1 is 4.718 feet when you add together the uh, flow depth and the velocity head. And now, um, let's see, I moved the, uh, I said minus delta Z over to the other side uh, for some reason. <laughs> I guess, uh, no, I guess the 4.718 is after I move it back over to the, uh, to the left side. And so that would be the energy at 2 after the drop. Okay, so then uh, we have to multiply each of these terms by y squared to get it out of the denominator. You get a cubic equation and you solve the cubic equation and reject the negative value and then these two roots one of them is the supercritical root one is the subcritical root and we choose the subcritical root of the uh, cubic equation because of that Froude number from before yes oh in the, the negative root mm. yeah I, I mean, what I want to see is that you were able to find two roots and that you knew to choose this, either the sub or the super of those two. 
So, I mean, you should show at least two of them, but, I mean, why not all three? The more's the merrier, right? Yeah. I mean, because it could be any of those three that satisfies the flow depth. So conceptually, I mean, it's easy to get hung up on uh, just punching stuff into the calculator. And, and I mean, that's important. You have to be able to solve these. But for now, what I, uh, I want you to feel more confident about is the underlying physics of, like, why the depth would be getting larger and relating this to the specific energy diagram. And let me point one thing out. All right, so the solution here said, what was the depth before? The initial depth was 3.5, right? 3.5, and what was the drop? 1.2 plus 1.2 is equal to 4.7. If we just added them together, this is saying 4.708. And that's because the specific energy diagram is nonlinear. Let's look at that curve. Um, it's, in some parts, it's pretty close to linear. Let's look at this theoretical graph again. The, uh, the more into the, the right side of this, it gets, it gets more linear. If we're pretty close to the critical depth, then this is curved, and you'd find more of a difference between the uh, Y1 and the Y2 than would be predicted just by the delta Z. So in this case, 4.7 just by adding them together is pretty close to the answer we got because we're operating in the range where this curve is fairly linear. But there can be cases where that would actually be a poor approximation, where just adding the initial depth and the drop wouldn't give you anywhere close to the new depth downstream, particularly when you've got supercritical conditions. Because down here in supercritical conditions, the depths are changing very rapidly um, in response to increasing energy. All right, so that was a, uh, let's see, here we are, the bed drop. Any questions? Any ideas that come up as we step through that? So how would you go about figuring Y2 if it was at critical? If it's at critical, there won't be a Y2. Okay. Yeah, there would just be, it would continue to be critical conditions. Yes? Yes. And if it's supercritical, the depth will decrease. So let's look at, oh, we'll do supercritical in a minute. Okay, so that's a bed drop. So a bed drop is you're gaining energy at 2. So the delta Z increases how much available energy there is at 2. A step, if you're going up, that's like removing energy from the system uh, because the water's having to flow up over that obstacle. And so I want to point something out in this figure. And the first thing is that here there's this dashed line above the water surface as the abbreviation TEL. And what they mean by that is the total energy line. It's just a slightly different abbreviation than our fluid mechanics book would have labeled that EGL, energy grade line. It means the same thing. It just means the, uh, uh, the total energy line would be the elevation plus the depth plus the velocity head. So the point that this figure is making is that when the water is flowing up over an obstruction, the total energy line is constant, even though you're going to have a decrease in the specific energy. Because some of the specific energy is translated into the now gain in potential energy represented by the delta Z. All right, so if we just look at what's being uh, summarized here, E1 is the specific energy at 1, including the depth and the velocity head. E2 only is measured from the channel bottom. So it's not measured from the original datum of the lower channel at 1. It's measured to the new datum of the elevated channel bottom at 2. And so E2 is the flow depth and the velocity head. So this is showing that the water has to flow up over that obstacle. And in the case of subcritical conditions, as it does that, the depth will decrease. And um, we'll look at the specific energy diagram to understand why. But you have to think about the specific energy at 1 as how much energy is available to do the work of getting up over the obstruction. 
you know, getting up, pushing the flow over the step. And if the delta Z is too big, then there's not enough specific energy at one to do the job of pushing the water up over that obstruction. In this case, it looks like the water isn't pooling upstream, and so there is enough specific energy. There's a limit to how big delta Z can be. We'll talk about that maximum limit of how tall delta Z could be before it causes choking. Um, now here, like I just mentioned, the specific energy at two is lower than, there, than it was at one because of the step delta Z. Uh, total energy, though, is constant because we have the elevation increasing. All right, so here's the diagram. Following the same approach as before, where you start off at Y1, our original depth, and we go over until it hits the specific energy diagram, and we go down to find our energy at 1. And this time, instead of shifting to the right, we shift to the left, because the left represents a loss of energy. So whereas before we were gaining specific energy by dropping down, now, E2 is going to be lower than E1 because the flow had to climb up over the delta Z of the obstruction. So now we have E2. There are two possible depths that it could be. And we choose whichever represents the flow conditions that were at 1. So if you had supercritical flow at 1, then you'd choose the lower of those two depths. If you've got supercritical conditions, oh wait, I said super already. If you've got subcritical at uh, one, then you'd choose the, uh, the higher depth. So it's the same kind of idea. It's just that instead of moving to the right on the specific energy diagram, we move to the left on the specific energy diagram. Anyone want to guess what is the maximum? Looking at this picture, what's the maximum delta Z that can be tolerated? You said Y critical? What do you mean by that? It can't go past Y1. Okay, so the, the, the amount of energy associated with the critical, the delta Z can go only that far. Once this delta Z goes further than the amount of energy associated with the critical depth, that's when choking will occur. We'll take a look at that later. I just couldn't resist the spoiler, though. Because there we were, we were looking at the delta Zs and they're getting closer and closer to that terminal point. And once that delta Z gets that far, that's as tall as the choke can be before pooling has to occur upstream. Here's what happens if you've got supercritical flow. So we've got the water moving very quickly, supercritical conditions at one. How do we know it's supercritical? We don't have a Froude number calculated, but we can look on the picture and see what they're, what they're telling us is that the YC is taller than the actual flow depth Y1. So this picture is kind of illustrating supercritical super conditions at 1. And uh, because of the step, now if we were to look at the specific energy diagram of this, here's our Y1. We go over and down to find the E1. And then we shift to the left, because shifting to the left is a decrease of specific energy because of the step. And then we go back up. And so it's kind of counterintuitive that actually now the flow is going to be deeper than it was before. Because we've only, until now, mostly been talking about subcritical conditions. But now, if you just look at this new reflecting point off of the uh, specific energy diagram, if we take it over to the left again, Y2 is greater than Y1. So it's still subcritical, but the, the depth increased because of that step. So what, what happened to the velocity? It decreased. How do we know the velocity decreased? Because it has to, right? Because if the, if the depth is larger, then it has to slow down. Otherwise, continuity wouldn't be uh, honored. You know, Q1 equals Q2. And so um, if, if the cross-sectional area is larger at 2, and it is, assuming the channel width is constant, you know, for all of these, that's kind of been implied, that the width of the channel at 1 and the width of the channel at 2 is the same. So all that's been changing has been the depths. 
And so if the depth gets deeper, then that means now our cross-sectional area is higher, so the velocity has to go down. Otherwise, continuity um, would be violated. All right, so greater than the old depth. So let's try this one, uh, a step up. You did the step down example already. Let's try the step up. And this is in here, uh, traditional units. Make note of that. We've got a flow rate of 250 cubic feet per second. And at one, we had a depth of five feet and a channel width of 10 feet. Oh, I'm just noticing now a T. I'll change that before I get called on it. There we go. B. Just pretend like it was never even there. Let's never speak of it again. All right, so now we've got a delta Z of uh, 0.5 feet, and we want to find out what's going to be the new flow depth. And so you can do one of two things. Remember that we have to at first diagnose the flow regime. We have to find out is it super or is it sub. Well, you could calculate the Froude number if you want, or maybe it would be fun to calculate the critical depth instead and then just compare what was the depth at 1 to the critical depth. And, you know, that would be great because this is a rectangular channel after all. So we can calculate lowercase q since it's a rectangular channel. Remember that a, lower, uh, a rectangular channel enables you to get flow per unit width, which is capital Q divided by B. So why don't you do it that way? I think it would be better. Calculate the critical depth and then compare that to the flow depth at 1 to find out is it sub or is it super. And the reason why you care is later on when you're picking which route is the correct flow depth at two, you have to know whether to go with the deep one or the shallow one, representing the sub and supercritical depths respectively. All right. Maybe. Yeah. I have no faith in mankind. All right. Okay, so uh, we had subcritical flow. Was it great solving for the critical depth? Pretty great, right? All right. But remember, caution, warning, you can only use those rectangular channel, right? You probably said it under your breath as you were doing it, just to reinforce the warning. Never use this on a trapezoidal channel. All right. So you solve for the energy at 1, the uh, specific energy at 1, and there's less specific energy at 2 because of the step up. So we're extracting energy from the flow. Um, and then that's equal to the two places that the energy is, the depth at 2 and the velocity head at 2, expressed in terms of Q, because that's what we know at this point. We don't know the velocity. And uh, as I walked around, people were getting 4.38. And that's right. That is the uh, subcritical root of these three options. So if you solved it and got one point. If you got 1.762, then you just need to put in a guess value that's closer to your original depth of 5, and then the, uh, it will give you the root that is closest to its guess, right? All right. Not right. 1.76 is not right. That would be, hmm? oh, how do we know? Because that's the supercritical root. Yeah, so we go with the 4.38 because in our very first thing we did, we found that conditions were subcritical before. And so this is the supercritical root. That's the subcritical root. So we choose the subcritical one. Other questions? <clears throat> All right. All right, so here is the kind of a, a simplified way of calculating the specific energy. 
if you have if you happen to have conditions that are critical then you can find out how much specific energy there is because um, you know that two-thirds of the energy is as depth under critical conditions and so you can simply uh, if you want to find the uh, the energy you just say three halves of YC and that's under critical conditions and critical conditions aren't so rare as you might expect um, in a uh, broad crested weir for example if you put an obstruction in a channel here's a channel and we put in an obstruction then the water is going to pool until it reaches critical depth over that obstruction so y sub c so you can measure the uh, critical depth on an obstruction and um, they're using that to uh, to classify the flow rate through a channel but you can also if you know the the critical depth at a location you can find the specific energy in a quick and easy way so for instance if you have 50 cubic meters per second through a five meter wide rectangular channel so you can calculate the flow per unit width just by having 50 divided by five so the flow per unit width is um, 10 meters squared per second okay, so lowercase q is 10 meters squared per second for what's described here and so then that gives us a critical depth y sub c of 10 meters squared per second squared divided by 9.81 meters per second squared to the one-third power so that gives us a critical depth of 2.168 meters and so then the specific energy is just going to be three halves of that three halves of the 2.168 meters and that works out to 3.252 meters so we can confirm that just to make sure that that trick is uh, valid you know double check the uh, specific energy being three halves of the critical depth thing um, by actually calculating the velocity and so as a check what if we were to find the velocity of flow when we've got critical conditions and so the depth at the critical flow was 2.168 and so we can have the cross-sectional area and from that get the velocity 4.6 meters per second and so the specific energy is going to be the depth and the velocity head and so this kind of proves that the specific energy is 3.25 meters and that's the same as if we just said three halves of the critical depth so um, I think later on down the line you'll have a homework assignment where you can use that um, that shortcut that if they tell you the conditions are critical and you need to know the specific energy you just multiply three halves times the critical depth and you'll get the specific energy at that location mm -hmm. I did 50 divided by 5 to find the flow per unit width. Yeah, I didn't show that step, I guess. No, maybe. No, no, no. Yeah. All right. Uh, good question. So the depth is two-thirds of the energy. So YC is two-thirds of E. So therefore, E is three halves of YC okay are there other questions so for bed step the equation that you use to find the new downstream depth it's the specific energy equation now um, delta z causes a change in the depth if we had subcritical flow then what that did was it, it decreased the downstream depth y2 
And if we make the step even bigger, so now delta ZB, the step is larger than it was in this first illustration. And so what that does is it forces Y2 even smaller than it was. And we could make it keep getting larger and larger, this step up, until we reach a threshold. And we already talked about in the specific energy diagram what that threshold was. Is the delta Z can only go as wide as the distance up until the uh, critical depth. What this is showing is this, remember the Y2 keeps getting smaller and smaller. Well, the smallest it can get is the critical depth because that's the most hydraulically efficient depth for flow to occur. Remember, in the beginning of the lecture, we saw a figure that showed that the way that you can get the most amount of flow through for a certain amount of specific energy is at the critical depth. So once we've got to the critical depth, we can't, we can't get any more water through this channel with that same amount of energy. Or in other words, the amount of specific energy that's available has been reduced so much because of the step up, now our flow capacity is compromised. And so what we're going to have to do is accumulate more energy. And that's what pooling is. In here in the figure D, this is showing lots of things all at once. And so let me uh, explain what the, uh, the Y1 and the Y prime one and all of that is illustrating. Um, Y1 was the flow depth before choking occurred. It was the original, you know, Y1 was the same in all of these figures. In figure A, B, C, the Y1 was the same. That was the original upstream flow depth. Now Y prime one is how deep the water's going to get to accumulate, to accumulate enough energy to get over this bigger delta Z D. Delta Z D is some step that's beyond how much can be accommodated by flowing at the critical depth at location two. So we were at this threshold, we were at the maximum step depth, and then we took it a little bit further. So what that means is when you make the step even a little bit, bi uh, even a little bit bigger, now there's not enough energy to get over the obstruction. And so in response, the water will temporarily back up downstream until the depth increases. And when the depth increases, now we've got more energy. And so it will come into equilibrium. Uh, temporarily, uh, there will be an accumulation of water upstream until the depth increases, and now there's enough energy, and then it will flow over that obstruction at the critical depth again. And so, again, in, in illustration D, you can see it's still flowing at the critical depth um, because that's the most efficient depth for the water to go at. And so it will just only accumulate water upstream until there's enough to get it over the obstruction. And so Y1 was the original depth. Y prime one is the new depth after the choke. And E1 was the original amount of energy that was there before choking. And now E prime one is how much energy is there after choking. And you'll notice that E prime one is, uh, is the energy upstream. And now E prime two is how much energy there had to be downstream uh, to overcome the obstruction. And so there's more energy downstream as well. And it's the minimum amount of energy associated with getting up over this obstruction. So we're going to spend a lot more time uh, next week talking about chokes. There are different ways to choke flow besides just uh, increasing the step up like this. You can also make a channel really narrow. And if you make the channel narrow enough, that can cause an obstruction so that the water starts backing up upstream. And one way that we make channels more narrow, for example, is if you put a bridge over a river and you put a pier down to support that bridge, now all of a sudden you're effectively making the channel narrower than it was before. You're reducing the flow area. And so one of the things that they're very careful to do in a hydraulic analysis of putting in a bridge is if there's going to be a pier, then um, does it cause choking upstream? Was there a question? Yeah. For a flume? Um, no, it's actually, it's something different that uh, 
for for example in the hydraulic jump um, uh, we'll be we'll be using a, a different equation for that yeah are there other questions yes good question yeah um, we wouldn't use this in um, in pipe flow because um, there really isn't like a, an analogy in in pipe flow if, if the water is going uphill there's there's never a situation where um, like a critical depth is where you're uh, approaching a critical depth you know um, the flow uh, between two points only occurs when there is less energy at the downstream point compared to the upstream point. But here we've got kind of this constraining factor of the critical depth. Like the flow can't go any less than the critical depth. And so uh, it, it, it's, that's a good question. Like how does this relate to pipe flow? And it's something completely unique. All right, so I kept you uh, about a what? A minute late last time. We'll let out a little early today in recompense for that war crime. I'll see you on Tuesday. Uh, so you've got some water gems to do over the weekend, right? Let me know if you've got questions and I'll do my best to respond. I'll see you on Tuesday.